So Metallica, in that A-tier gap between Hardwired and Death Magnetic, got into a lot of different projects, such as the Orion Music Festival and playing a concert on Antarctica. And one of those most interesting projects was Metallica working on a 3D movie. And that movie is Through the Never. So today, we're reviewing the film and discussing different aspects about it. So, let's start. So, the biggest part of the movie was Metallica having an incredible, badass live concert. They wanted to make the crowd absolutely mesmerized with what they're witnessing. They wanted to create a fascinating show, full of illusions, effects, and great theming. So, Metallica rented a huge indoor stage and put together one of the biggest productions that any concert would ever have. The idea behind the stage was that they were gonna take some of the icons that represented the iconic albums and have them all on one stage, such as Lady Justice from Unjustice for All, The Toilet from Metal Up Your Ass, and The Crosses from Master of Puppets. Peter Minch had this vision in terms of bringing in a lot of the imagery from the album covers. He had an idea for a stage that, that had all these, these uh, what do you call it, effects? He said, what if we took the snake pit from the Black Album? What if we took Doris, the Lady Justice, and brought her back on? What if we took all of these great things, which I called the greatest bits, not the greatest hits, and put them all together onto one stage? However, there was one album art that never really had any visual representation in Metallica shows. And this album art is from Ride the Lightning. Cause come on, how can you recreate lightning hitting an electric chair on a stage? It's impossible, right? We always knew that we had a visual, a really good image that we never really used, which was the electric chair from Ride the Lightning. Well, Kirk actually suggested a way of recreating the iconic Ride the Lightning look on the stage. And that was by using Tesla coils. The answer for that though was always no. It's so dangerous and deadly to use Tesla coils. It seemed like an impossible task. And the Tesla coils was one of those things, you know, can't we have real electricity? And everyone just said, no, it's, it's, it's fucking dangerous. All right. It's deadly. I said to Winky, we need Tesla coils, not the small ones that you can buy in, in stores. I went to a science fair once and I saw two gigantic Tesla coils. I know they're out there. We can get it. We can get them. We can do it. But Metallica was very dedicated into visualizing the iconic Ride the Lightning look. So they tracked down a company of people who were huge supporters of Nikola Tesla, the genius behind the Tesla coils. And this company could make it happen and turn lightning hitting an electric chair into, well, a reality. And for a second there, Metallica was like, wow, we can actually do it. And yes, during testing sessions, the Tesla coils provided a beautiful effect. It looked absolutely magnificent and also realistic, but danger was still an obstacle. There is something known as the sphere of death. It's the area in which a Tesla coil works in, that if you step in it, you get zapped till you're dead. Any mistake with that sort of equipment could lead to absolutely lethal outcomes. Normally, we don't even let people approach this sphere of death. The sphere of death. The sphere of death. Sphere of death. Apparently, it's a sphere of death. The Tesla coils were also causing trouble with other things in the stage. For example, it made electricity go out sometimes, and that would cause problems with the equipment, like the guitars and the bass. And that's pretty logical when you have such a strong flow of electricity. Of course, it's gonna tamper with the equipment. I mean, it's great. It causes some problems with the rest of the electronics in the show. You know, no one ever figured that a Tesla coil would fry equipment, but it does. So overall, recreating Ride the Lightning's iconic look was a huge challenge, but I think all the hard work paid off. In the end, it resulted in something truly beautiful. Metallica also wanted to add a visual representation of Lady Justice from the Unjustice for All album art, which, unlike Ride the Lightning, has been done before in the past in the Justice Tour, and the idea was to have a huge Lady Justice sculpture be there throughout the song Unjustice for All, and then it would wobble and become unbalanced until it would eventually collapse, and her body parts like head, arms, and shoulders would collapse into bits on the stage. 
Metallica wanted to do that again in Through the Never, but this time they wanted to have it on a much grander scale. They wanted it to be bigger and better, and they also wanted the illusion itself to be smoother. In the 80s, they would have these ropes attached to the statue, and they would pull these ropes to have the statue fall down. In 88, that's when the first doors, it was smaller, it was simpler, it wasn't in the round, it was behind the back line, behind the drum kit. So we could stay hidden behind with ropes and we would pull on her to make her wobble and move. They wanted through the Never concert though to have a much more organic and natural way of having the illusion happen. So first they had to figure out a way on how to assemble the body parts of the sculpture and then how to make it collapse. They first thought of using vacuum tubes to hold the parts together, and then, when it was the time for the statue to be destroyed, they would just release the tubes. The concept of putting doors together was originally using a bunch of vacuum tubes to hold her together so that when we released the vacuums, she would collapse. But that did not work at all, and they had to start from scratch and figure out a way on how to keep the parts assembled and then destroyed. So instead, they used magnets to hold the bits together. And when they wanted it to collapse, they would have a pin that comes down, and that pin would have arms that would push the statue so it would fall. They put the pieces together with magnets, which is how it is now, I think. But then, of course, it won't fall to bits. So they have a pin that comes down, with arms that come out and push it away. The statue was also very unpredictable. Sometimes it would collapse to command, and sometimes it would not move, which was of course very frustrating. Also how and where the pieces of the statue fell was also very unpredictable. According to Rob, one time two of the pieces almost destroyed his entire base collection that was hanging someplace on the stage. She's so unpredictable. Sometimes she falls, Sometimes she doesn't. Chunks of her may end up in the audience. I know that the other night, a couple pieces almost took out my bases. And there was a lot of other cool aspects to the stage. After all, Metallica had like 30, 35 trucks worth of equipment. So it had to include a lot of cool shit. Indeed, there was a lot of awesome visual stuff. For example, you had the death magnetic shaped coffins hanging over the band there. You had the master of puppets crosses coming from underneath the ground. You had the toilet for metal up your ass with the sword hanging from it. And you had a ton of cool lighting equipment and effects that would make the band look cool as hell. Through the Never concert had this accident scene included, which was of course staged. Metallica wanted to shock people with this accident scene as if something was really wrong. So, you know, lights going off, people falling from the ceiling, a person catching on fire. Metallica really wanted it to look realistic. But people did not freak out though. And thank God they did not freak out. With that number of people, it would have turned the stage jam into, well, mayhem. I guess a lot of people knew it was staged. And this accident scene was inspired by one of Metallica's most iconic shows, Cunning Stunts 1997. Metallica also had a very similar stunt scene with James crumbling to the ground, a guy catching on fire, things falling, all of that. So Metallica was even inspired by some of their old shows to make the biggest and best show they've ever done. The theming in this concert was overall top notch. This is the level of visual effects and illusions you see at Disney World, not on a metal show. They were surrounded by all of that danger in sake of providing the people with the best visual experience they can get in a Metallica show. It's such a powerful feeling to know that you're surrounded by all of this danger, but it's working in your direction. It's working with you to bring an amazing visual experience for people watching it. The film was initially intended to be only a 3D concert movie, but Metallica thought that was too uncreative and too obvious. They wanted to provide some sort of cinematic value to the movie, a narrative that coexists with the concert, which is the main focus of the movie. So of course, they had to hire a director to make this movie into an actual thing. Metallica contacted a lot of directors, but they were all so uninterested in the project because directors like to have the upper hand and control when it comes to the creation of movies. However, on Through the Never, a lot of the decisions were made beforehand. And even after the director was hired, Metallica still had a lot of control over the movie. Lars had met with a lot of other directors and they seemed to be not so interested because it wasn't maybe enough of the right challenge for them. 
in taking something like this on. I guess in the film world, you know, directors like to have control from the beginning. We had already designed the stage. Um, the, a lot of the songs were already sort of chosen. Directors usually would like to build the stage themselves and design it full on, you know, and uh, so, so it was kind of a weird situation. Metake eventually hired a director called Nimrod Anto, and he began working and implementing his vision into the movie. Metallica also went out to search for the lead actor of the movie, and their choice was Dane DeHaan. And they had to borrow him for some time to shoot the movie, since he was kind of busy playing Harry Osborn on The Amazing Spider-Man 2. Metallica then went to have some practice before they shot the movie. After all, this was a concert different compared to anything they've done before, so they had to be well prepared. They went to tour in Mexico and brought all of the crazy equipment with them. No one knew if the Tesla coils would work, or if the Lady Justice will fall, or if the show in general will be a success or not. Metallica just went to these shows to have a good time, test the equipment, and rehearse for the movie. Leading up to Mexico, the show wasn't ready. No one knew if the Tesla coil would fire. No one knew if Doris would fall. No one knew if anything was going to properly work. Despite a couple of weeks of production rehearsals in California and the band being there, and there just wasn't enough time because that is a gargantuan production. Metallica, for the first time in their history, had eight shows in the same tour, B in one city, which was Mexico City. In 31 years, it's the first time they've done eight gigs in one market. How will they even sell the tickets for eight nights in just one city? But the surprise was that all the shows were a blast. The Mexicans came to every single one of them. Mad the Mexicans have a good energy and passion for Metallica. Metallica then went to film the movie in an arena called Rexall Place, which was a huge stage in Edmonton, Western Canada. And also some of the other footage used in the movie was filmed in Vancouver. Now let's get to the financial aspects of Through the Never and see how much the movie cost and how much did it earn. Well, Metallica, while making this film, could not find any investors or production companies that were willing to produce this film because it was a huge risk. So Metallica, at the end, made the movie out of their own pockets, and Metallica's company was the one that produced the film, which is Blackened Recordings. And also, that has its advantages. Metallica could have full control over their project without the studio or production company interfering with Metallica's image. Fast forward another six months, can't get any investors. The band finally decided, you know what, we want to do this more than anyone else wants to do it with us. So we're just going to finance it ourselves. And there was the general awareness during the making of this movie that this film was so freaking expensive. And there were a lot of concerns that this movie will fail and not make its money back. We all saw the crazy advanced expensive things that Metallica had to buy for this movie. So this concern was very plausible. This movie is going to be so fucking expensive. No one's thinking about how we're going to make the money back. I, I don't even know how we're going to break even. And through the never, indeed did not succeed at box office, which was such a shock for such a big band like Metallica. The movie grossed about $3.2 million, which is nothing compared to its shocking $18 million production budget. And that's not even including the cost of marketing and advertising for the movie. The movie indeed was a catastrophic financial failure. There are a couple of logical reasons that could explain why Through the Never was a box office flop. The first of these reasons is marketing. The movie really was not promoted well at all. Well, for instance, a lot of people did not understand what the hell this movie was. Was it a concert film? Was it a narrative? There was this general confusion regarding what this movie was supposed to be. And that was because the movie was not promoted well. Also, actor Dane DeHaan was not really a big box office star to begin with. He is not the kind of actor that would be the primary reason for people to go watch the movie in theaters. He is not really an actor that would attract tickets. And all of that did not matter anyway, because they hid half of his face on the movie poster. He wore a mask and a hoodie. So, if you're casually going to the movie theater, this poster would not attract you. Also, the Metallica logo on the poster, where was it? Well, I mean, it was included, but it was so tiny and unseen that again, if you're casually going to the movie theater, you would not be able to see that this movie is linked 
to Metallica, one of the biggest bands in the history of music. And of course, if the logo was a bit, I don't know, clearer and bigger, the logo itself would attract some potential viewers. So overall, marketing was a weak point concerning the movie. Another logical reason this movie was a box office flop could be the director of the movie. Not taking anything away from Nimrod there, but he is not really a big name in the movie making industry. I don't think anyone really knows him, or people that do know him knew he directed a pretty questionable Predator sequel. So getting a director that had his place in the movie making world could have meant more tickets sold. When the Rolling Stones were making their movie, which was called Shine the Light, the director was freaking Martin Scorsese, one of the greatest and most respected directors in history. So you would see why the Rolling Stones movie was a success, and Metallica's simply wasn't. So the director is an important selling point for movies in general. And fun fact, Nimrod directed a couple of episodes in Stranger Things last season. Another reason that really makes sense on why this movie failed is that the timing for the release was simply horrible. Metallica wanted to make the movie available in IMAX theaters to do justice to this fascinating visual experience. The problem was though that Alfonso Cerrone's movie Gravity got released about the same time Through the Never was released. So about a week or so of Through the Never being exclusively in IMAX theaters, it had to give up most of its screens to Gravity, which was expected to be a huge hit. So the timing could not have been worse, because you had an obviously more important movie to cinema fans kind of take the attention away from Through the Never. James was very shocked and upset about Through the Never failing. He was blaming everyone, the distributors, the manager, the director. He was like, you all fucked up. And then he realized that Metallica made a choice by working on that movie. And if anyone should be blamed, it should be the band members themselves. Lars, however, didn't seem to care at all for the movie failing. He was like, this is an interesting chapter in Metallica's life. And the money we lost, we could probably make that back from album and t-shirt sales. But he thought it was a movie he was proud of and that could be respected and appreciated more as the time passes. Metallica is the only metal band that could lose about $15 million and not care, am I right? So what is the idea behind the movie? Through the Never is a movie split into two parts. The first part or the main part is the concert and the second part is the narrative. So the movie is kind of a contrast between the main character Journey, whose name is Trip, and the awesome live show, which was kind of a pretty unique idea for a band making a film. And the movie actually got pretty decent reviews overall. Because yeah, to be honest, it's a good film. On IMDb, it got a 7.1 out of 10 rating, which is a fairly decent rating. And on Rotten Tomatoes, the movie got an 80% fresh tomato rating, which is actually quite good. Looks like the critics really enjoyed this film. Let's first talk about the live show aspect of the movie, which is the longest and best thing about Through the Never, in my personal opinion. And this concert was awesome. It's everything we expected and more. It looked like all the hard work exerted, really paid off. Everything looked magnificent. The lighting, hitting the electric chair with the Tesla coils looked beautiful. The part in Cyanide where the coffins were above the band, it looked awesome. Lady Justice falling into bits while playing the song and Justice for All, it looked realistic and shocking. Also a Master of Puppets where the crosses rose from under the ground and there was this colored gas around the band, that was awesome. So overall, the visual aspect of the concert couldn't have been done better. So what is the plot of Through the Never? Well, the plot starts out when a Metallica staff member asks Trip, the main character, to go deliver some gas to a truck that ran out of fuel. And that truck was supposed to be headed towards the concert. And the staff member also asks Trip to go search for a thing that was inside this truck that the band really needed. Yes, that's what we pay you. Now look, we got a truck that's out of gas in the city. You gotta find it. And we got something the band needs tonight, okay? So you don't pass go, you don't collect 200 bucks. Get him back, you know what to do. Good boy. And on his way going there, he experiences a lot of hardships. Trip's experience was written by Nimrod, and the plot was inspired by a novel called The Alchemist, where its plot is similar in premise, which also talks about a person searching for something and going on an adventure full of hardships along the way to find it. Nimrod was inspired by a book called The Alchemist, 
and it's really a, a one man's journey through life and, and, the, and the struggles in life. Nimrod wanted to make a narrative that did not really include any dialogue at all. He wanted little to no speaking in the story and he mostly wanted to fill the movie with action sequences. For example, you have the scene where some guy driving hit into Tripp's truck while trying to escape from something. Trip going in the middle of a conflict between the police and a bunch of rioters and they also had the scene where those rioters chased Trip down and engaged in a fight with them so the approach was like let's do less dialogue more action. The storyline I mean it was set to a script that had no dialogue and so it, it could have easily have been super like uh, uh, op open-ended you know in, in the create creative uh, 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 creative stage. Nimrod also wanted Trip to have some sort of object or toy that he was attached to and that would be with him or keep his company throughout his journey across the movie. So as shown in the movie, Trip had this creepy looking doll that he loved very much. The little man is something that Nimrod brought to the creative. He said it's really important to me that Trip have some kind of talisman, some kind of object that means something to him and it was in the very first pitch. So what was the thing that Metallica needed very much? The trip was risking his life trying to find it. It's actually a bag. Or they needed the thing that was inside the bag, but they just never show us what was inside of it. They just leave it to our imagination. And people say that Through the Never is inspired by Pulp Fiction, since Lars is a huge Quentin Tarantino fan, which is a very logical statement. The whole bag premise is present in both where characters are searching for a briefcase that has a very valuable thing inside, but we never actually see it. It's totally left up to viewer interpretation. We only see characters gazing at it in fascination. So yeah, I really agree that this particular plot thread is very much inspired by Pulp Fiction. I actually have a theory that is pretty convincing about what the bag represents. I think the thing that was inside the bag was the soul of Cliff Burton. Cause of course Metallica needs Cliff back in their lives. And there's also another proof for that. During the credits, Metallica plays Orion, which as we all know is Cliff's song. And then after the song ends, there's a close up on the bag and then the screen goes black, which kind of shows that there's an obvious connection between Cliff and the bag. So we discussed everything we could today about Metallica's 3D movie, Through the Never. So tell me what did you think of the video and what do you think of the movie? Is it a good movie or is it a bad movie?